Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, this uh, so this week's parsha, uh, I'm guessing because I see it on my on my screen here is uh, Shlach. Uh, it is so. Let me synopsize since we're not actually reading it. Um, the Israelites have found themselves uh, at the edge of the Negev, I guess, and Moses is directed to send spies into the land of Canaan. Uh, spies is perhaps a harsh word, scouts, into the land of Canaan to see what's what uh, and to bring back uh, samples. Uh, this is very sciencey. Uh, to bring back samples of the fruits and plants of the land. So they go for 40 days. They, uh, they travel about visiting various places and come back and give their report. Uh, at re their report is that the land is lush and wonderful, and it is filled with uh, dangerous people, with walled towns and well-fortified and who know how to take care of themselves. Now, uh, one of them says, ah, I think we can take them. Uh, and that would be Caleb. And the rest of them say, no, have you seen those guys? They're huge. They would totally kill us. Um there's some discussion, some dispute. Uh, they get informed that they're going to be spending 40 years wandering in the wilderness because they chickened out, essentially, of uh, going into the land. A few of them say, oh, well, if that's the basis, well, we're going to go and try to take them anyway. And they get totally destroyed uh, by trying to go, go in when they don't have uh, the support of either their people or... Uh, the Holy One. Um, it's then followed by an entire chapter of recipes. So this is a little odd. Uh, but let's think about this a little bit. So what's going on here? Now, now I think the important thing in many ways is that uh, there are some things that you can say here that are not exactly new. And yet in every generation, we need to refresh our understanding of them. In science, we have a a bit of wisdom that we tell ourselves and we tell to each new entrant into the field after us that success teaches you nothing, that failure is when you learn. Uh, it's a profound truth, but it's not exactly original. People have been saying this for a long time. As I said, we have to teach it to each new generation when they encounter failure and need to, the strength to keep going and carry them through that. Now, in science, We've institutionalized this concept in the scientific method. We actively seek opportunities to fail, uh, where we take what we think we know and we push it to where it doesn't belong uh, in order to see, do we actually know what's going on in the world? Because if our experiment turns out right, all it tells us is we haven't pushed hard enough yet. Uh, but when our experiment fails, it tells us we've learned something new about how the world is built. This is why we do things that are not actually needful uh, in a lot of cases, that people look at that and say, why are you doing that? An example would be colliding atoms. It's not because it's useful or because it's productive. It's because we only know so much, and it's an opportunity to test whether we actually understand the world. But this, I, mean, I don't want to dwell too much on science. It's just my closest example. We are not the only ones who have used this profound truth to guide us. I would say that the entirety of myth and literature entirely depends on the idea that failure is when you learn. A hero is not a hero until he's been humbled. Uh, until then, he's just a successful jerk. It is only when you are defeated and have to carry on anyway that a hero becomes a hero. Uh, in the first of the great epics of human history, Gilgamesh, the epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is a mighty king, but he's not a hero until he meets Enkidu, who at first is his opponent and becomes his friend. Enkidu, a power equal to his own, who is able to defeat him, or at least to bring it to a draw. Uh, later in Greek mythology, Theseus or Odysseus are both mighty kings. But they're not heroes until they're humbled by circumstances. In the, in the case of both, really, they're humbled by their own thoughtlessness, that they thought they were so great that they committed grave errors 
that resulted in disaster. In the case of Theseus, his father throwing himself into the Aegean Sea because Theseus simply did not think to change the color of the sails on his ship. Odysseus, because he thought he could just take what he wanted from people, violating the rules of hospitality and sending himself on a very, very long road trip. And finally, a, a more recent classic. In Rocky IV, uh, Rocky Balboa supports his friend Apollo Creed in facing the mighty Ivan Drago, despite the odds, and Apollo is defeated and killed, a power equal to Rocky's own, leading Rocky into the mother of all movie training montages as he goes off to become the man who could defeat Ivan Drago. Remember, Apollo was his equal. That was in the first movie. Neither one of them actually came to a victory. They both defeated each other. They both were victors, and they became friends after that. And as so in Rocky IV, the hero goes into the wilderness to gain what he needs to overcome his own failure. It's not his opponent that he needs to defeat. It's his own failing in how to confront his opponent. That was his defeat. In their own case, back to the Israelites, remember them? They discovered their enemy, and they quailed in fear. Some of them tried to violate this classic literary convention. They said, oh, well, wait a second. We don't want to spend time learning. We're just going to go ahead and go fight them anyway, because apparently we should have done that, right? That's why we're being punished. And so they go to fight the enemy, and that makes them the cautionary tale because they're defeated completely. And so the rest of the Israelites go to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, cue the training montage, to wash away the old and to gain what they need, not so much in fighting skills, but in character, in self-reliance, gaining what they need in order to learn and to become the people who can be victorious ultimately. And ultimately, a mere 40 years later, they return to the field and they achieve victory and enter into the land of Canaan. Now, victory is an ambiguous term because victory is back to success. And as I said, success is not your teacher. Only failure is your teacher. And so there are many ways that literature has handled victory. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as I want to wrap up the story. And so the hero defeats his implacable foe. Yay, victory story is done. Uh, in others, the hero defeats his implacable foe, but only momentarily. And the foe will come back. Uh, you can think of Beowulf, where Beowulf defeats Grendel, but Grendel's mama comes back and she's angry with Beowulf. But in the best of stories, the hero he may defeat his enemy, he may fight his enemy to a draw, but he liberates his foe as well as himself because his foe is just as much a captive of literary convention as the hero is. Because of course the foe was successful the first time around. The foe is now the one who has learned nothing. And so when in their final confrontation, there's an opportunity for both the foe and the hero to become heroes. Uh, in just sticking with Rocky in the very first Rocky movie. That's how Apollo Creed and Rocky are both liberated from their limited understanding of themselves. In Rocky IV, Ivan Drago is actually liberated from, in the case of this highly partisan movie, Soviet ideology. And they, again, because they respect each other as equals rather than seeing one as a defeated foe and the other as a victor. In Gilgamesh and Enkidu, uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, they become friends uh, and go on many adventures together, but they are now equals. They do not keep returning to the field of battle again and again and again. In all cases, you must remember that your opponent also learns from defeat. Your opponent also gets a training montage, and ultimately then if you are victorious, you become the foe for your enemy. So respect the literary convention. The best of these stories end with a victory, not of the vanquished and the victor, but the vanquished and the victors are both the same people and carry on together to a, a better future beyond. And that's all I have.